Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ginger Broderick, and I'm the host of the Ginger New York TV show. Guess who our guest is today? It is music journalist Jeff Slate. He writes for the Wall Street Journal, Esquire, and Rolling Stone magazine. He's also joined by his friend, rock star drummer Alex Alexander. He's returning to our show today. Thank you guys for coming Hi, in, Ginger. Jeff. Happy to be here. Wonderful. Hi, Ginger. Oh, you guys, you were on my guest wish list for years. That's and very flattering. Yes, and I've gone to many of your shows, as you as well, and then I saw the two of you were performing together, and I was like, boy, one day I want to do a show with you guys. And it's here. It's yeah. finally we are. Yeah, we thank you. Thank you so much. I follow so much of your writing. Um, I noticed that you started writing with the Wall Street Journal. I did. Good. Congratulations. Thank Great publicist, you know, publication. And uh, Esquire, Rolling Stone. And, and I've seen your name on other smaller publications as well. You really great, great things. How did the two of you meet? We met 25 years ago. Gee whiz. Um, Jeff was a songwriter and he was looking for a drummer and an engineer friend of mine recommended me. Wow. And we did some recordings down at Dessau Studios. That is true. Yeah. Wow. And we had a terrific time. We became good friends. Yeah. Very good. And have played together ever since, on and off. Yeah. For 25 years. Well, you know, I kind of stumbled into the music scene. You know, I was a swimmer and I got injured, and I was like, I got to fill my time. What am I going to do? So I went to BB King's, and it started my rock and roll fan, you know, experience. And I uh, expanded, and and I really enjoy the music scene on New in New York City. Are. And here we are. And and I've been influenced by all of you guys to take guitar lessons and uh, bass guitar. I'm level three now. I'm finishing up. Excellent. And, and I can understand your conversations. And what does level three? What does <laughs> well, that means like, I, it's not yeah. a video game. I'm <laughs> curious, what does level three mean? It means I pass one and two. And I'm almost <laughs> done. I'm almost there at four. Um, level three. Yeah. 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 Brown belt. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what's new with you? you? You do so many things. You have so your band, things. too, that I you're do. the drummer for his band. I do. Yeah. Well, we've been playing a lot lately. We just mm -hmm. did two shows um, in celebration of David Bowie mm. at Hill Country because they had the David Bowie Is exhibit. Gee whiz, it was Brooklyn. wonderful. I was there front row. I'm Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I didn't get a chance to see it. Oh. I'm, I was so <laughs> You were in the back. You, <laughs> didn't you curate a, uh, a walkthrough for people uh, at the Bowie Museum? Uh, no, but I interviewed... Uh, they had an event mm -hmm. with an audience, and I interviewed Tony Visconti okay. for that about mm -hmm. his lifetime career with David. Oh, I think they did, wow. you know, I don't know how many, 20 some albums together. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, wrote about the, um, the exhibition for several publications. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it was um, great and amazing, and I hope they are able to do something with it beyond, you know, now that it's closed, they're saying that's the end. Oh, no. There's, I know, there's going to be a virtual reality version of the show. Oh, my. Yeah, um, they, yeah it has to continue. I, pe I didn't get a chance to see it. So oh. many people wanted to see it. I, the last day I called about a ticket, and they were like, it's beyond sold out. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really was. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I, I got calls, people like, can you get me in? And oh, wow. By that time, it was. I was there, my brother was visiting in May and we went, that was our one thing that we wanted to do sure. and we spent three hours there and we could have stayed more, you know? Well, I think I went, I, I, I went go a few times. four times Did you? in total. Yeah. It was like, I, we went to the, I, I took my daughter to the press preview mm -hmm. and we spent about, four, we were the last ones to leave, we spent about wow. four hours mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Then that weekend, opening weekend, we went as a family mm -hmm. and we spent two or three hours. And then I, when I, I subsequent, subsequently went, uh, I've forgotten why, but just to go. And then when we did the event with Tony, they gave us a little private tour after the event, which was amazing because it was empty and it was very wow. cool. Kind of, yeah. Jeff was the person to go with. Yeah, I was kind of the person to go with. I didn't realize it. <laughs> now I realize that it's close. Okay, bring it, yeah, yeah. Jeff, bring it back. Jeff, that would have been that would have been a good one to. Yeah. yeah, and Mike Garson was there as well, oh. David's keyboard player. So it was oh. that was the night you should have come. Yeah. yeah, I saw that too. I saw that you were doing that, and I was like, gotta get there. Um, I really enjoyed it, and I hope uh, it uh, it opens again because it was so popular. Yeah. It was so popular. But maybe bring it back. So. I saw you, boy, tribute. The two of you were performing. It was what about a month ago at Hill Country. Yeah. That was a great song. I thought I have followed you for years. I've been to many of your shows. You have, yeah. But I really, and I also That's know you from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I've I've seen you perform at the Fest for Beatles fans too. Oh, so yes. I've seen you there, and uh, I just really think the two of you have great, 
you know, performance. Thanks, Ginger. Yeah. Thank we you. have a great time. We have a great band. Thomas Richard Marlin plays bass, and mm -hmm. Earl Slick plays every now and then, and Gee. Mark Bosk is the guitar mm -hmm. player. Uh, I think Mark Platty. Mark Platty. Shannon came in last time. Mark Platty, Shannon, Shannon Conley. Conley. Amazing mm -hmm. vocalist. Yep. Yeah. Who's the other singer that was there? There's that a day? keyboard player. Wasn't he? Let's see. Uh, Michael T. Michael T. Michael T. Michael T. Sat he did with a great job night. He too. was fantastic. Yeah. yeah, and we'd never met him before that night. He yeah. just tore yeah. the roof off the place. So and yeah. I think yeah. Benny Lando's going to play with us on the twenty fourth. Right, we're playing at Hill Country on um, Friday, the twenty fourth of August, and Mark Bosch is out of town, and so is Earl Slick. So Benny Lando's going to well, sit in wonderful. with us, and he's a uh, just an amazing, very vocal accomplished guitar player. player. Wonderful. Yeah. How many gigs have you done there? Shows? Believe it or not, well, we just hit our fifth anniversary there. Really? Which yeah. means 60 mm -hmm. shows. So now I think it's about 62 or three. You do it once a month? We do. Yeah. Oh, wow. Sometimes I more than one a month. Sometimes, oh, no, no. you know, they're spread out a little bit. Basically once a month. That's my neighborhood. So I kind of drop in. That's mm -hmm. right. You're kind of in the neighborhood too. Kind of. Yeah. Next neighborhood over. <laughs> <laughs> it's New York City. Yes, right. It's yeah. an island. <laughs> and, um, what are you doing these days, Alex? I am getting ready to go on the road with uh, Larry Mitchell, mm -hmm. and Larry. it's Kirsten Dean's band, and uh, her and Eric Boyd's playing bass. Oh, and okay. We're starting in Minneapolis on Monday, uh -huh. and then uh, traveling across the Midwest. Uh -huh. We're going to have a great time. So I'm happy to do that, and then I'm coming back and I'm playing with Jeff okay, on, on the, the 24th. 24th. Mm -hmm. Very good. I'm and heading out to the Midwest that day, so I'm going to miss you. Uh, but now I'll catch you next time. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're well, we're, we're hmm? back there. We're actually back there for a, a sort of combo show in October for John Lennon and Tom Petty's birthdays. Oh, wow. So that would be a good one. Oh, to, yeah. That, that was good. good. You guys are really fabulous musicians. We are. And I love your writing. I really enjoy you. why, you know, all the reading all. And you did this book here. Jeff did this book. I, I wanted to I hold did. this up and Congratulations. Make sure. That, uh, the Authorized Roy Orbison. It's a fantastic book with some terrific pictures and a whole lot of history of Roy Orbison. Mm -hmm. And it was done with his sons? Yeah, Roy had started a book before mm -hmm. he died, long before it was, mm -hmm. you know, something rock stars did. And then uh, after he passed away, his wife Barbara picked up the idea mm -hmm. and worked on it a bit. Um, and then it just, after she passed away, it just kind of fell into the abyss. So his sons more recently um, decided they wanted to do it. He has three sons, Wesley, uh, Roy Jr., and Alex. And not they, me. Not that Alex. <laughs> Alex you confused me. <laughs> who's a, Alex is also a drummer. Right, right. who's on first. And so <laughs> Alex uh, O. I had interviewed Alex Orbison back about five years ago or so for Esquire, and we hit it off, and he knew I was a fan of Roy's and very knowledgeable about Roy. They had literally a vault of photographs wow. and research, about a million words of research, just interviews with Roy and everything you could possibly imagine from over the years, over the course of his career. And they had this idea for a book. So I knocked that into shape, and we got a great uh, book deal from Center Street Books, um, who put it out last October. Gee whiz. Uh, and it was in conjunction with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra album of mm. Roy's music. Where which they, is a fantastic book. Which is recording. a fantastic. Yeah. We had a little book event, and Alex came, and he was wowed by it. it, was, it it's pretty amazing, the album. Um, they played the three songs, which I. I Where, fell was in love with those songs Where was right this? Where was this held? At the old Hit Factory, oh, wow. the Gibson Showroom. Yeah, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, it kind of took off from there. And then, subsequently, we did a bunch of promotion for the book. And one of the things was we did a tribute to the Traveling Wilburys because this year marks the 30th anniversary of the Traveling Wilburys Incredible. at the Fest for Beatle fans. So we played all Wilburys music or Wilburys related music and the Orbison brothers joined us for that. I was there, and boy, was that a show. Yeah. Wow. And then I went to the drummer's forum, and Alex O was there. I didn't see you there in the audience. No. Uh, well, that was the thing. We had a drummer, because we had <laughs> Alex Orbison, who's a drummer, drumming. So I had to settle had with that <laughs> Alex rather than this Alex. But and Alex is a good drummer. He's, he's a good drummer. very yeah. good drummer. Yeah. He's a good drummer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and when you talk about this vault that you had to organize, did you get to go through all of the material? No, they, they had a team of people who work in Nashville. Okay. They have a curator, they, they have a, a husband and wife team who do kind of 
you know, curation for a better word, and then they have a team of people who work for, you know, RoyOrbison.com, mm -hmm. uh, and their company is called Roy's Boys because it's all the sons, mm -hmm. and uh, they have a very able group of people who really know everything that's in there, whether it's, wow. you know, photographs or concert tickets or posters or you know, all the records from various countries all over the world, because Roy was very, very popular in uh, England and Germany and all over Europe and especially Australia. So uh, they know where all that is. And then they supplied me with about a million or so words of information about Roy. It's just every interview he'd ever done that described, you know, different aspects of his career. And then I had to condense that into about, I think it came down to about 50 or 60,000 words. So yeah. it was it was quite an undertaking. Quite it was, an undertaking. It was great. And, and it's a terrific book, as you can see, some fantastic pictures in here. Is that John Lennon? No. No. That's no, Roy. but they were very close. He was very close with all the Beatles. And yeah. you know, uh, Roy was the inspiration for Please Please Me, which is the Beatles' mm. first number one hit. It was originally kind of a slow I never knew that. Roy sounding mm -hmm. song. Uh, and uh, Love Me Do as well was mm -hmm. Roy Orbison inspired. And they toured with Roy. Mm -hmm and got to be friendly with him. And they were all friends with him. Uh, John kept in contact with him until he died. And, and George, and George, of course, was in the Traveling Wilburys, and they were very close. They mm -hmm. worked together a lot. But McCartney and Ringo were also good friends with Roy. I mean, when, when Paul and Linda lived in Nashville, or outside of Nashville, when they were recording in the mid-'70s, they went and visited Roy at his home, and Roy came to their rented house in Nashville. They recorded. Um, Junior's Farm and parts of Venus and Mars there, so oh. that was kind of, but they all kept in touch. They were good friends. What was Roy's relationship with Johnny Cash? Well, Johnny was the guy who introduced, uh, Johnny was the guy who introduced Roy to Sam Phillips at Sun Records. He came down to Texas to do a television show that Roy was a regular on. He mm. did a weekly television show there. And he cornered Johnny Cash and said, how do I get on Sun Records? Mm. So Johnny said, you know, gave him Sam Phillips' number, said, call this guy. And of course, on Monday, when Roy went and called Sam Phillips, he said, Johnny Cash doesn't run my label. And he hung up on Roy. <laughs> but, you know, it eventually worked out. And Roy and his band ended up on Sun Records for a time until he ended up at Monument, where he became, you know, the huge mm -hmm. star that we know about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Good question. I, I love history. Music history is one of my favorite things. Uh, the past sets up the future. Absolutely. You know, and we learn from our, from uh, the people that came before us. Yeah, I mean, I think what what's, what attracted, what was attractive about me to Roy's sons was that not only was I knowledgeable about Roy and had a real love and affection for him as an artist and you know a creative force but that I'm a musician myself mm -hmm. and, and that I understood it in a different way mm -hmm. and could hopefully tell the story from maybe a little bit the inside out, you know, from a creative mm -hmm. person's point of view. Mm -hmm. Because Roy was no longer around to tell the story himself. That's really yeah. amazing, right? Yeah. yeah. Always uh, jaw-dropping to hear mm -hmm. the stories about Roy Orbison and his singing is incredible. Every time I put on a record, I'm blown away by his soul. Mm -hmm. He has so much soul in his singing. Yeah. I met a driver once out on the road, and he told me he was a driver for the Wilburys. Oh, my. And he said, you know, one time um, Roy came on the bus, and they were talking, and then Roy goes, you know, you know, I'm the only real singer here. <laughs> 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 Those guys are just faking it. They're, they're riding on uh. my coattails. <laughs> I love footage on how they funny. came together with their music. You know, they kind of locked themselves in in someone's home, and I think it was in California, and they yeah. just spent a couple of weeks together writing songs. I, I was lucky to talk to Tom Petty once about Roy, and, and you know, I, I asked him, you know, about his memories, and he lit up instantly because he said Roy was this amazingly sweet guy, but he said when they were... George and Jeff Lynne, who produced the Wilburys albums, would you know sort of sit at the control room and have each of them go out into the live room and record a complete vocal for the song to kind of audition who would be the best singer for that song. And he said he remembered sitting on the couch and Roy would be sort of practicing next to him. 
in this kind of half voice. And he said even when he was just sitting, like singing in your ear, practicing the words there, he said it was like an angel singing. He said, you know, how can you compete with Roy Orbison, who's sort of the greatest singer? Yeah, ever I, in, in yeah. rock and roll. Yeah. So. And uh, Bruce Springsteen, I know, was a big fan of his. A big fan, yeah. yeah. And, and a, you know, I mean, he mentions him in Born to Run, but he inducted him into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, yeah. and Bruce was very generous, and he allowed us to reprint his entire induction speech in the Gee. book. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Special permission. Wow. <laughs> and you played with um, Bruce Springsteen, didn't you? At the I used to play with Willie at the Light of Day mm -hmm. concerts every January, mm -hmm. and Bruce would come in and sit in with us, and mm -hmm. uh, and it was always a great experience. Um, well, the one thing about playing with Bruce that I noticed was when we rehearsed the song, he would just sit there quietly and listen, but then we'd go out on stage and, and we'd run through the song, and he would find whatever was missing. He would listen, and he would just find out, listen in his head, and then he'd figure out what's missing and what would be the best thing that would elevate everything else. And he always did that in a very quiet and humble way. And my appreciation of, of Bruce grew leaps and bounds after playing with him, because I saw that he did that every single time. You recorded with David Bowie, too. You want to tell about that experience? Yeah, I, um, I got a call from Tony. Actually, I got a a message from Tony Visconti saying that uh, he wanted some, me to play on percussion on a record, but he couldn't tell me who it was. And then I didn't, I wasn't sure if it was Bowie or someone else until I got there. Mm. And I was very lucky and thanks to Tony, I uh, spent the entire day with, with David. Um, and he explained uh, some of the songs to me and I asked him to explain where they came from so I could come up with some percussion parts. And, mm -hmm. um, and then after it was all done, um, almost a year later, I got a beautiful copy of the record with a hadn't written note from David thanking oh me. Oh my goodness. Which I, I've never received anything like that before after a session. I, I really appreciate it. Wow. Um, and David was just a fantastic singer and songwriter. He mm -hmm. was an artist in every way. I work with um, Albert Watson. He's a, mm -hmm. s a Scottish photographer and he's done a lot of covers for Rolling Stone and he uh, photographed David Bowie. Mm -hmm. I think I t sent both of you some of his photographs right yes. in collage yeah. and he, he said that David was real, a real artist. He really enjoyed him and yeah. I think he along with everyone else in the world was so disappointed when we lost David Bowie. He always picked the best bands. When I, I met him when I was really young, mm -hmm. um, I got invited to a rehearsal, and he had Tony Thompson and um, he had uh, Carlos Alomar, Carlos Alomar, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Carmine Rojas. Wow. I mean, just the who's who. Stevie was the was about to become really huge right before that rehearsal. Um, he he had a great eye and ear for great musicians. Mm -hmm. Mike Garson, who played with him over the course of David's career pretty much, said to me once he was like a casting director. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of like Bruce Springsteen. He knew the holes. He mm -hmm. knew what was missing mm -hmm. and what he needed in those. Mm -hmm. And he would pick and choose the right person to fill that, mm. that gap and whatever. What was amazing with the exhibit was uh, the amount of, to learn how many books that he read and traveled with and yeah. to, to see how he wrote out his songs. I mean, it, it was incredible. It's almost like he had it right in his mind, like he didn't have to cross out and mix and like how I write, <laughs> he just wrote it out. And I, what I enjoyed about learning about him, that it, he was an actor early on, right. and um, he was a mime actor. Yeah. Right. And his parents really developed his, allowed him to develop his creativity. Well, and I think that helped him, you know, he had a presence on stage, you know, I, I saw him probably uh, 10 or 15 times live, and uh, oh. maybe more, and, and um, you know, he had a presence on stage that was unlike other certain rock and ro you know rock and roll mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. He carried himself in a different way. He projected in a different way, and I think a lot of that came from acting and mm -hmm. mime. You know, mm -hmm. he he just kind of presented things in a more theatrical way that wasn't you know campy or weird or you know whatever. Mm -hmm. It was truly him, mm -hmm. but it was very different than say 
you know, Mick Jagger or mm -hmm. Bruce Springsteen or mm -hmm. even Roy Orbison. You know, mm -hmm. it was just, it was very much his own. Mm -hmm. It's just another tool, you know, when you're out a, a, as a performer. Um, I've taken classes uh, like in improv where I took an acting for non-actors. And it was really interesting to see then how people are trained. And um, I wasn't very good at memorizing lines, so I'm better at improv. <laughs> and, um, but uh, I think it's a great skill to have, and you never know when you have to pull it out. Well, I think most, most people don't appreciate enough when you're on stage, you know, all the things you have to keep in mind and all the things you have to do. And certainly most young musicians don't think about that. You mm -hmm. know, there's a whole, there was a whole school in the 90s of shoegazing musicians, and it, it became kind of a joke, and it was a, a sound and a movement. But by the same token, those, from my point of view, those are people who, while it's okay to do that, if that's your thing, certainly there is a way you can find your own voice in presenting mm -hmm. yourself and presenting your music. I mean, I know um, I was never a front man. Alex, Alex will attest to this. It was a bumpy road for me to find my feet as a front man. I'd always been in bands where it was like co-lead singers or, you know, a couple of guys who sang and kind of, you know, it was tag team. But when I made the leap, and, and really very much after my band, the badge kind of, you know, fell apart in the, in the late 90s, uh, early uh, mid-2000s, um, where I had to become a front man. And I watched people, you know, David Bowie was not kind of a person I could really emulate. It's much more theatrical. Mm -hmm. But I watched people like, you know, Bob Dylan or Roy Orbison, mm -hmm. and, and very much Tom Petty, who I got to know a little bit, and him. watched him you know, the way he works a crowd, the way he manages the band, the way he manages the flow of the show. Those, there's lessons in any video you see on television in how those people kind of keep control over things. When, I mean, Alex will tell you, it gets pretty chaotic up there a lot of the time. Sure. And, and the thing you have to do is try to stay as calm and po as possible and kind of stay totally focused on your performance and the audience. But as a front person, you have to keep in mind what everybody else is doing and all those pieces that Bruce was kind of putting, you know, together in a puzzle in his head. It's funny how the night's never seen the same. It's funny how the days, they never changed. Dreams of people 
people that are dead and gone Instead of what I really Instead of what I really Instead of what I really want to say yeah. It's funny how the nights never seem the same Funny how the days they always change It's funny how you've made me feel like a superman It's funny how I hope it never ends So I work real hard And I paid my dues If the love 